In this video, we're going to focus on mass spectroscopy. So here we have the mass spectrum of pentane. And just to give you a little background information on how this technology works. So basically, you would take a sample like this one pentane and put it in a mass spectrometer. And what's going to happen is that sample is going to be vaporized and then it's going to be ionized using an electron beam. Now, when it ionizes, it can fragment into radicals and cations, but only the positively charged ions will make it through the analyzer and reach the detector. And in this graph, on the y-axis, we have the relative abundance of the fragments. So this represents the quantity of the positively charged fragments that reach the detector. And on the x-axis, we have the mass to charge ratio. Now let's say if we get a methyl cation, typically the charge will be plus one. So if Z is one, then M over Z becomes the mass of the fragment. So what we want to do in this example is we want to determine what fragments will form and which of these numbers these fragments correspond to. If you understand this, then you could use this to identify which molecule corresponds to which graph. But for now, let's identify the fragments that form in pentane if we put it in a mass spectrometer. So let's call this carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, if we break the C1, C2 bond, it can split up into a CH3 group and a butyl group. Now typically one is going to be a radical and the other one is going to have a positive charge. Now carbon has an atomic weight of 12 and hydrogen is about 1. So CH3 is 15, CH2 has an atomic weight of 14 and if we add up 14 plus 14 plus 15 plus another 14, this will give us 57. So 57 could correspond to this particular fragment. Now we don't always have to get a methyl radical. We could get a methyl cation. If we do get a methyl cation, then this molecule will be a radical. So this is another possibility. But it's important to understand that only the positively charged fragments will reach the detector. And so the methyl cation could easily correspond to the peak that we see at 15. Now what about the peak at 43? That peak is known as the base peak. It has a relative abundance of 100%. So everything is compared to the base peak. The peak at 72 is known as the parent peak, also called the M plus peak. And it turns out that it's simply the mass of the compound. If you add up 15, 14, 14, 14, and 15, this will give you the total molecular weight of pentane, which is about 72 grams per mole. And so that corresponds to the M plus peak. Now, if we break the C2C3 bond, we can get these two fragments. We can get an ethyl radical or an ethyl cation, but I'm only going to focus on the cations at this point. Or we can get a propyl radical or even a propyl cation. Now, anytime you see a CH2 group, it has a, a weight of 15, and a CH2 group has a weight of 14. So the ethyl cation has a weight of 29. So that corresponds to the peak that we see here. As for the propyl cation, if you add 14, 14, and 15, that will give you a total of 43. Or you could do 72 minus 29, and that'll give you 43. So the propyl cation corresponds to the base peak. 
Now here's a question for you. Why is the purple cation the base peak and not the butyl cation? Let's compare both of them side by side. If we break the C1-C2 bond, we could get a methyl cation and we could get a primary butyl cation. Now, which situation leads to the formation of more stable fragments? In the first scenario, where we break the C2-C3 bond, notice that we have a primary ethyl cation and a primary propyl cation. In the second situation, where we break the C1-C2 bond, we have a primary butyl cation and a methyl carbocation. So a methyl carbocation is less stable than a primary carbocation, which means it's easier to break the C2-C3 bond as opposed to the C1-C2 bond because this will give us more stable fragments. And that's why this is more abundant because it's easier to break the C2-C3 bond. Now it's important to understand that both of these cations can rearrange to a more stable secondary carbocation. But the reason why this is the base peak is because it's easier to break the C2-C3 bond due to the formation of more stable carbocation fragments. This one is less stable, so it's going to be harder to form. And so that's why this corresponds to the base peak. Now let's clear away some of the stuff that we have on the board. So at this point, we've identified all the peaks. So the peak at 15 corresponds to the methyl cation. The peak at 29 corresponds to the ethyl cation. The peak at 43 corresponds to the propyl cation. And the peak at 57 corresponds to the butyl cation. At 72, it's the original compound that lost only one electron. Now what about the peak at 41? How can we get that? So starting with the propyl cation, this molecule can lose two hydrogen radicals. And if it does so, what's going to happen is we're going to get an allylic carbocation. And this carbocation is stabilized by resonance. And so that's why it's very abundant as well relative to the other fragments. So it's relatively easy to form this particular carbocation. It's primary and it's allylic. So if this has a mass to charge ratio of 43, and if we subtract 2 from that, then the mass of this particular fragment will be 41. You can add 14, CH is 13, plus another 14. That'll give you an M to Z ratio of 41. Now, it's also important to understand how the primary carbocation could rearrange into a secondary one. So let's start with the propyl cation. A hydride shift can occur, converting the primary carbocation into a secondary one. So this is going to be CH and then CH3 with the plus charge on the secondary carbon. And so the M to Z ratio for this as well will be 43. So this carbocation can easily be arranged into this one as well.